good morning. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So today um, I'm going to present a paper dedicated to a very precise issue that is the right to data portability. Uh, more precisely, I'm going to uh, make a more complex picture uh, about what it, what does mean to implement such a right. So I'm going to start with a very, no, okay, I think I can't um, control it. Okay. Oh, okay, I, I was interested. Okay. Um, so starting from data portability, I think the audience is very well trained about what this concept is about. So this is a, one of the many definitions that are possible. Uh, it is the ability of an individual to port his or her personal data from a service A to a, a service B. So why is this right so uh, important and why is it in the GDPR? So there are two main reasons. Um, the first one uh, is that it gives a stronger uh, control on, per on personal data uh, especially on the data protection point of view. Uh, on, and second phase, it, uh, there is also an economic impact of, of the measure because in theory, data portability allows uh, a pro-competitive effects and more innovation because it allows a smoother flow of data between different digital services, thus allowing, allowing uh, more, more actors to entry in the markets. Uh, and moreover, it uh, make easier the switching between different services uh, for users. However, there are also some criticisms about uh, such a right uh, because there are some potential dangers for data security because uh, it makes uh, the flow of data more frequent. And it could be also burdensome for some actors uh, to implement such a, uh, an option in the services. Now, um, the right was uh, sorry for the uh, the right was um, uh, was uh, added uh, in the European Union framework through the Article Twenty of the GDPR, and it is, it is mainly composed by three rights: um, the right to receive data concerning a data subject which he or she has provided. Uh, the right to transmit such data to another controller, and finally, the possibility to ask uh, a data controller to transmit such data directly to another controller. Now, the issue that I'm raising with the paper is that this on paper is a wonderful idea, but there are a variety of different gray areas that could be interpreted in various ways, and these could, uh, at the very end, impact on the economic and data protection effects of the right. So the first um, gray area is the technical feasibility concept. What is the meaning of technical feasibility? Uh, the article states that the right to have personal data transmitted directly from one controller to another uh, were technically feasible. Now, this is actually uh, unclear, uh, and this could be a basis through which a data controller refuses to give, uh, to give such an option. Another um, unclear area is uh, the fact that the, the right could be either interpreted as a right that is continuous. So after I make the request of having my data ported, uh, the data controller is obliged to transmit such data on a continuous ba basis. On the other end, uh, another interpretation could be that the data has to be transferred every time I make a request, but only in such a, a itera iteration. Another um, particular uh, unclear point is the concept of the uh, data provided uh, by the data user. It is unclear what is the meaning of provided, uh, because it could be interpreted either as the data that are inserted, for example, by compiling a form, uh, or uh, on the other end, this could be interpreted as provided under a legal basis of consent. So every personal data that is uh, basically captured by the service under the legal basis of uh, uh, consent. So. Finally, there's a, a last gray area that concerns the relationship with intellectual property rights and trade secrets, uh, because it is not clear how 
um, um, how such a, a right could be balanced with uh, um, intellectual property rights. For example, a data controller could say that it can't transfer uh, some kind of data because another data controller could retro-engineer uh, the algorithm that is using uh, through, the, uh, through the data that is transferred. So how can we uh, investigate such an issue? Uh, now, the, the mental framework that I think we have all in mind is this one. So basically, there's a regulator that is the European Union and a target that are data controllers. And basically, what is going to happen is that we have uh, the GDPR that is interpreted by the data controller that will choose whether to interpret these gray areas in one way or another. However, um, in my paper, I raised the question that maybe the problem is more complex than this one, uh, than, in, than this. Um, I want to bring a, an example right now. Uh, that is the KUIY scheme. What is the KUIY scheme? Um, this scheme is a regulatory scheme, uh, but uh, um, created not by a state actor, but by a non-profit foundation. Now, this scheme could, can be joined by non-state organizations, for example, firms or uh, no-profits. Uh, and the scheme has also a variety of branches that could be defined as regulatory branches. So there is a judiciary, a legislative and executive body within uh, this foundation. Uh, and there are also law enforcement procedures. Now, what is this scheme about? Well, the, the members who join the scheme uh, have access to a standard of data sharing and portability. So in a way, we could say that there is an additional uh, regulator when we speak about data portability for a member that joins such a scheme, such a foundation. So now the uh, new model could be represented as, as that. So here we have a target that is a data controller that joined the QIY scheme. And then that is, and that is now regulated both by this voluntary scheme and by the GDPR. So we have an intermediary. And this, of course, is going to impact on the interpretation of these gray areas we were speaking about before. So basically, um, we are speaking about a particular kind of regulatory schemes that is sold uh, by actors that could be public, private, uh, or no profit. Uh, but what is the particular thing, what is the particular feature of these schemes? Uh, firstly, they are non-legally binding in the sense that we are not speaking about public regulation, we're speaking about voluntary regulation. So any actor could join it or not, but the, um, this membership is based on a contractual basis, so private law. Uh, secondly, uh, these schemes are uh, applicable directly to private actors. This means basically that, that these, um, these schemes offer the possibility to join uh, them under a certain uh, variety of criteria. So um, my research questions um, are bas basically, firstly, what is the um, size of this phenomenon? How many of these schemes do exist in the European Union? And secondly, which kind of actors are actually governing them? I try to empirically um, and analyze these um, two questions. Firstly, by creating a data set of this kind of schemes. Uh, and I analyze the period between 2000 and 2020 in the European Union. Secondly, I tried to analyze uh, the actors that are actually governing these schemes. And I'm going to show the use of the governance triangle model in the next slide. So firstly, the, um, the data set construction. Here you can see I uh, gathered all the uh, possible um, schemes that I found, uh, and I found 23 schemes operating in the 20 years period. Now you can see uh, some of the features that I analyzed. Uh, it is particularly uh, interesting to analyze um, that there is no common scope. Now scope means that a scheme is offering the membership either on a global basis, so the firms for all over the world can join such a scheme or could offer it on a national or regional basis. So either only from, for organizations from a particular country or from a particular cluster of countries. Now, as you can see, the majority of these scheme, uh, schemes offer a global scope. And this also, well, this makes sense because uh, we can think these schemes as a 
a possibility to join a network. So the wider the network, the, the better uh, for the members. Secondly, we can see uh, how many data portability schemes emerged in the last years. And we can see that this is the number of available schemes. So uh, it is a cumulative um, in, um, indicator. Uh, but we can see that there was a growing trend in the last years. And well, uh, of course, it is not a surprise because well, the topic of data portability uh, and of the data flows emerged in the last 20 years. But it, it is also interesting to see that these schemes were available way before the GDPR was enacted. Finally, here we can see um, the uh, governance triangle. Sorry, can you? Um... Okay, thank you. So um, this shows a snapshot of the existent uh, schemes in 2020. Now, uh, each dot represents one scheme. So one regulatory scheme that offers a voluntary standard for data portability. The position of the dot represents which kind of actor between NGOs, firms, and states is in the executive or legislative branch of such a scheme. And here we can see, for example, the QIY at the bottom uh, scheme we were speaking about before has in its, go its uh, governing bodies uh, both members from NGOs and from firms. But uh, the most interesting pre um, feature here is that the majority of these schemes are governed by firms. So they have a business, um, they have a business origin and governance. Here we can see also a chro chronological uh, um, uh, series of snapshots from different um, periods. Uh, thank you. And well, um, the interesting trade uh, also here, we can see that the, the, the firms and the business side was preeminent also uh, during the first year of uh, two th 2000s. Um, now, um, speaking briefly about the results. Now we can see, uh, as I said before, that the majority of schemes has a global scope, and this makes sense on the point of view of network uh, externalities. Uh, secondly, there's a dominance of firm-driven initiatives, and there's a growing number of schemes. And finally, uh, and this is um, maybe too soon to say, but we can see from the number of schemes available that the GDPR that was enacted in 2016 and um, implemented in 2018, may, it doesn't seem to have a significant effect, but it may be too soon to judge at the, at the moment. So um, what, is this what is this study telling us at the very end? So uh, firstly, data portability regulation did exist before GDPR and did exist um, and it was governed by non-state actors mainly. Um, secondly, I think that especially uh, in the more advanced phases of GDPR implementation, we have to speak about how private and public regulation are interacting in the implementation of many of uh, the new uh, data protection rights. And finally, of course, uh, but this is something to, to reflect upon, and maybe there are some contribution that, contribution, uh, contributions of that. Uh, on that um, there is, of course, a potential problem of accountability, because if a public right uh, becomes intermediated too frequently by private actors, this could be a problem on the implementation side. Finally, um, of course, the Data Governance Act plays a big role, uh, will play a big role, because many of uh, these schemes can be defined, can be, can fall within the scope of data intermediation services, sorry for the uh, for the wrong uh, uh, for the wrong typing there, um, so these actors will be regulated by the new D D data governance act. Uh, it is still difficult to understand what will be the the, um, the effects of that. And finally, further research, of course, uh, this was a study on the number and the type of actors out of schemes available, but it is not clear uh, first how these actors directly impact on the gray areas we were speaking about in the beginning, and secondly the number of organizations that are participating to such schemes. Thank you. This, from a formal perspective, this is kind of the perfect paper. Mm -hmm. It has a very good balance. It's, it's a very relevant topic. And, and but, but the, the formalities, it's very mature. It's very mature in the structure, in the drafting. It's very clear the message. The reader knows at every second where, where we are, where you want to take us. 
the structure is very well defined at the beginning, and then it's very well executed along the, uh, the paper. And it has kind of the perfect balance between a strong theoretical framework and then a, a good empirical analysis, very complete, very good, very nice graphics. So I think it's, it's very, I would say very mature in terms of, of, of publication. I mean, it's perfectly be published just as it is at the moment. And, and I, have to, I have to admit and congratulate you because I just read the paper, worked on it, and only afterwards I identified that you were so junior because I thought it was a paper produced by a, already a, a mature um, academic. So congratulations. I think it's a, it's a, a very promising work of, of what will come next. Um, and then I would like to make some comments, which are not really criticisms or way to improve the paper, maybe a couple of points, uh, but rather on how to expand a little bit the scope of, of the paper, which I realize maybe that you are so young that, I mean, the work on the specific field that you are studying is very good, but maybe you lack a little bit of perspective um, of, of where this data portability um, right comes from and the implications and the connections with other fields of, of regulation. and. Uh, Coming from telecoms regulation, which is what I did my PhD on, I think there is a very obvious and interesting connection with number portability. And it, it's not just the name, it, it's not that the name is, is similar, it's that the scope and the evolution and the origin um, are pretty much alike. And, and it shows, it helps to identify a little bit why number portability was so successful and it works and we probably everyone in the room has used number telephone number portability, but this data portability is still quite foreign to us. Why? What are the differences? Why one has worked so well and the other one is still something that is kind of emerging? Um, I think it is very important to understand where these rights come from, and it is that they have a double source. On the one hand, they are a right for the individual. So number portability, it was a right for the consumer. I mean, you have your own telephone number and you can port it. And this is the angle that in GDPR has been, uh, I mean, that is the source of, of GDPR for data portability. So it's pretty much about GDPR is about rights for data subjects on how to control their data and warranties. So it comes from this first source of, okay, it's about rights. But then if you go to number portability, there is a, an obvious second element, and it is about liberalization. It is about increasing contestability, and there is a whole literature on market contestability. Increasing contestability by reducing barriers to entry derived from locking effects. And that's why there was this idea, consumers will not leave the incumbent, the monopolist, if they have to change the telephone number. So if we want to create competition in the market, we have to introduce, to reduce or even eliminate this barrier to entry to make the markets contestable. Now, this is very clearly a second source. You made a reference to it, to a vague reference to efficiency, but this is absolutely fundamental in the, uh, uh, in the evolution. Maybe it was not so important from a GDPR perspective, but now it's very clear because it has been introduced in the DMA, in the Digital Markets Act. So the regulation of the gatekeepers, which is about contestability very openly, even in the title of the, of the regulation. Um, so I think that if I would have a, a suggestion is you need to reinforce a little bit more on the paper, this second, second element in this portability and coming from number portability, I think it applies very well to, uh, um, to data portability. Now, Again, going back to the experience with number portability, and I, have to say I personally worked a lot on it and the implementation of number portability in a number of countries, legislation on number portability was basically one sentence. I mean, it's very easy to impose a number portability obligation, but the implementation in terms of um, technical specifications, obligations, even the governance, the collaboration between the carriers to have number portability implemented, was a massive amount of work. Now, that's what is missing in GDPR. I mean, you just impose this sentence as an obligation, 
but there was no work on the implementation, no technical specifications. No, um, so this second part, which was kind of 99% of the work to implement number portability is completely missing in data portability. And that's according to my opinion, why it has not worked. Mm -hmm. um, and then you don't have the very clear leadership of a regulatory authority, a national regulatory authority as in telecoms, pushing, imposing obligations, defining the specifications, because that's not the role. And I, I guess that, I mean, um, the authorities in charge of data protection, I don't think they have even very often the knowledge to, to make these implementations. Um, so that explains why you have all this, what you're referring to this private regulation, because you don't have the public leadership in the definition of all these elements that are absolutely fundamental, without which number portability would have never occurred based on just private regulation. Um, now, it's not always, the same. It's, it's not just the same. I mean, there is a very fundamental difference between number portability and data portability is that the ecosystem for number portability was very small. It was just a very, it was just telecommunications operators, which even in very, the number of telecom carriers is rather limited. And you had a very clear leadership of the incumbent, a couple of large carriers. So, I mean, you had a very small community, furthermore, which was, very used to work together. And for instance, in mobile communications, you had roaming, which was built purely on, on a voluntary basis. You had a very close night community, which was uh, already used to work together. Now, you don't, uh, and, and number portability, let's not forget, it's national. It all takes place at the national level. So it's national level, you have a regulator and you have a small number of players being coordinated. So it was, much easier to implement. Now, data portability, I don't think most portabilities are interesting just to take place at the national level. Probably you have to go beyond national level. So you, that's why you have all kinds of uh, governance problems. And, and it's, it's not only the level, it's that you have a very wide scope of entities that would be interested. It's, it's even difficult at this stage to picture who are the entities that should be implementing this data portability? So it makes it far more complex to, uh, to implement this. Uh, and this is why all these, um, yeah, your theoretical framework of, of, of the intermediaries, the voluntariness, and the, it, it's so interesting because it's like, probably it's, I mean, definitely we don't have it and it will take a while to have a full rec public regulatory, traditional regulatory framework. So we have to work with what we have. And you, I think you use the right tools to analyze the theoretical framework. Then you went into the analysis of these 23 entities who are they, I mean, it's very nice. Theoretical framework is relevant, it's important and you apply it very nicely. And then you identify what is going on with, with these entities. Um, and then I have a but, maybe that that's the, I, if I'm correct, I mean, I, you didn't mention in the presentation, and as far as I, if I remember, you don't mention it on the paper also, this article sits in, in DMA. So data portability is one of the obligations to be imposed on gatekeepers. And not only that, it is that it's one of these obligations is article six, where the commission has the powers of defining kind of the re necessary regulation to make the obligation effective. So somehow, at least for the gatekeepers, at least for some of them, probably we are transitioning from this private regulation, which uh, has not been particularly effective, and it's not a surprise, to a scenario where it will not be national, it will be EU, but we will have an owner and we will have a regulator with the powers to define even the, I don't know, maybe even the technical solutions, but definitely we have a leadership in the regulation uh, to make data portability effective, at least in relationship with gatekeepers. It's, it, it's not the whole market at all, but it definitely it's, it's the more important um, platforms, those that have, I mean, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's Apple. So we will have, that's my assumption, we will have a real data portability for these entities. And once we have it for these entities, probably it will be easier to, 
to expand it to the rest of the market. So I think this is a reference. I mean, it, it's not what you have been analyzing, but I think a reference to this provision, which is pretty much final at this stage. So, so it's a, I, I, I think it completes the picture. I mean, it's, it's something that you have to, to refer to. But again, it's, it's, this is not what you were analyzing. So it's just a, a different issue. Um, so yeah, proposals. I think that this, uh, and again, it, it's a different paper, but, but this reference to this number portability precedent, which was so successful and that everyone had in mind we're talking about data portability is important. The idea of contestability um, as the second element in this um, data portability right that is so relevant and that's also to be the, and, and that it has been introduced in DMA. That's I mean it's because of contestability grounds that it's introduced in the DMA, not on GDPR personal rights. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I think it's. Uh, even with the adoption of DMA, again, it's not exhaustive. It's only for uh, gatekeepers. And I doubt even the intervention of the European Commission will be as complete as it was with number portability. So I would not expect a, I don't know, a complete technical specification drafted by the Commission and such a close overview of, of the implementation um, by the commission as it was with the um, national regulatory authorities in telecoms. So probably there is still some room for this private regulation, uh, even for gatekeepers and definitely beyond gatekeepers. So, so I encourage you to keep working on, the, on your private regulation and with tools that you are using because I'm positive they will always be relevant. But overall, yeah, really congratulations. I mean, it was a great piece of work.